All right, so this is a symposium on human-computer partnerships, and I'm here in my role as the chair of computer science for the 2021-22 um, year. And what's interesting, ah, come on in, <laughs> come on in. Um, about this is that this is an opportunity to get a series of speakers who I like their work that are interested in this problem. And so we've organized a series of talks by people who've done interesting work at the intersection between human-computer interaction and artificial intelligence. And so this morning, we will talk about human-computer partnerships. I will be focusing on how you design them and give you a number of examples. Um, and then we have Antonio Kruger from uh, DFKI and Saarland University, who will be talking about cognitive assistance for intelligent environments. And then Atal Tanaka, who is coming in from England. Um, he's a professor at Goldsmiths University. And he will talk about his work in music. He's a professional music composer and is designed with both musicians and blind users. Then after lunch, um, we will have talks from people who are at the intersection between human-computer interaction and AI, but focusing on industrial applications. So we have Thomas Baudel, who's the chief technical officer. He's at IBM Research. And he will talk about in the loop, on the loop, how to choose. Um, basically, how do you think about the role of the user in um, uh, working with a computer system, an intelligent system, and Antoine Marot, who is the lead AI scientist at RTE, which is the French energy company. And he's looking at AI assistance for power grid operators. And then I asked Théo Sanchez uh, this, uh, to speak after that. He's going to do a shorter talk, but his work is on interactive machine teaching. And I should say he's my student, um, along with Baptiste Caramio. And uh, then after that, we'll have James Crowley, who is Professor Emeritus at the University of Grenoble Alps. And he's going to talk about collaborative intelligent systems. So that's what we'll be doing today. And then tomorrow, um, Baptiste, who I just mentioned, um, will, who's a senior researcher at CNRS and also Sorbonne University, is going to talk more about the notion of interaction with machine teaching and machine learning. Uh, Janine Koch is an assistant professor at Inria Saclay, and she'll talk about human AI collaboration for exploring ideas and basically in creative applications. And then finally, we'll conclude with information theory and human computer partnerships by Michel Baudouin Lafont, who is professor of computer science at the University of Paris Saclay. What I wanted to say also is that we will be doing a closed workshop in the afternoon. Um, from 3 until 5, and there we'll be discussing things. And this is not going to be recorded for the public, but it is open to anybody who's interested in participating who's actually here. Um, so we hope that um, some of you participate in that as well. All right. Um, just very quickly, for those of us who are eating, we're going to um, have for the speakers, and um, we'll be going to lunch. That's where we'll be, and you should have that information. And then the basic idea is that we're going to have talks that are roughly 45 minutes long. And then I really want to encourage discussion um, for 15 minutes. I'm not sure if people who are remote can actually discuss or not, but at least we have enough people here so that we can uh, discuss. And finally, um, for the two-hour workshop, that, as I said, will be um, closed. And that will be really looking at how do we create a white paper or something that combines what we've learned from these two days of presentations and think about where we go in terms of next steps. So I titled this series as Human-Computer Partnerships. And for me, that's what happens when human-computer interaction meets artificial intelligence. And one of the things that's very important to understand is that I am an HCI researcher. I do research in human-computer interaction and have only recently started working with artificial intelligence. But what that has given me is a way of sort of rethinking how AI research is conducted and how it sometimes conflicts with what we do and how we frame research questions from an HCI or human-computer interaction perspective. And so what I want to do is tell you a little bit, just very, very quickly, about 
what human-computer interaction is as a field. So we have the idea of looking at human beings and we examine their perceptual, cognitive, and motor capabilities. We understand, we try to understand how human beings operate in the world. And on the system side, we think about you know, how do you store systems and what are, what are system capabilities? And that involves both the algorithms but also peripheral devices, how you put information into a computer, how you take it out, how the user understands what's there. So that's all very good, and traditional human-computer interaction really looks at the two of those. And what I'm going to argue um, for this, and in, it will probably guide a lot of my questions in the, in the discussions, is how do we think about the interaction between humans and computers? Not just humans by themselves or systems by themselves, but the back and forth interaction as a phenomenon that we can actually study as a real thing. And if we can study it, then it means that we have some idea of how to control it and make it better. So that's our goal. I work in a lab called Ex Situ. Um, it's part of the LISTEN laboratory, uh, which is newly uh, combined um, in the computer science, basically the computer, what you would call the computer science department at the University of Paris-Saclay. And I'm also a research director at INRIA, and I run a group of researchers, about 20, 25 people, depending on how many are there at the moment. And we do research in human-computer interaction. And what that means is that we develop what we call generative theory. I'll give you a little snippet of that in a minute. We also do a lot of design and development of prototypes. So we create examples of what we're thinking. And our goal in creating these prototypes is to challenge people and make them think about how can we rethink the interaction between humans and computers. And we also do a lot of work with design methods. All of these are topics that I've talked about in the series of lessons that I gave, although they're all in French, not in English. Today it's a little easier for me because it's now all in English. Um, but all of these are covered in the series of lectures um, for the Collège de France that happened in February and March and April, I guess. All right, so this is my team. We, do, we have four main research themes, fundamentals of interaction, human-computer partnerships, which is the focus of today, collaboration and creativity, and it's called ex situ. Our original group was called in situ, which was situated interaction. And then when we renewed it, we said, OK, we'll push the limits and go to extreme situated interaction. That's basically studying interaction in the context of use. And we work with creative professionals and scientists and people who push the limits of technology. So they are extreme users and often in extreme light, um, environments like uh, control rooms or other kinds of things. And so all of these projects, this is just from our website, and that's a nice bouncy balls that go around, and you can see different projects that we do. All right, I'm going to give you a foundation here of how to think about research. Um, and what we've got, this is very grayed out, but it's all right. Oh my goodness, you don't see the text. Ah, that's very strange. All right, that makes it more difficult for you to see what's happening. All right, let me, um, that's easier when you do that. Okay, let me just see, all right, no, sorry. That's a very interesting effect I have never seen before. All right, um, so what you should see on the top line is the word theory, and on the bottom line, is observation, or empirical observation. And if you're a natural scientist, what you do is you create theories about the world and the phenomena in the world, and you observe and collect data about those phenomena. And the point of this initial slide and the initial set of animations that you did not see is that for a natural scientist, when I, I might be, for example, an astronomer who's looking at the stars, or an archaeologist who's looking at artifacts and historical artifacts. In those cases, you start with observations of things in the real world, and then you develop theory, and then you generate new observations. If you are um, a physicist, or a chemist, or a biologist who's looking at the design of um, DNA molecules, what you'll do is you'll start with your theory, and then you'll run controlled experiments, and then you'll test your theory and revise your theory. And so there's this constant back and forth throughout all natural sciences between theory and observation or empirical methods. 
And then what happens is we are using all of that knowledge and those methods, but we are what Herb Simon calls a science of the artificial. So we actually create the phenomena that we study. We build interactive artifacts and we study them. So we create theory about them, which is what this idea of generative theory, the concepts and generative principles at the top, and we also create design methods that show us how to observe and interact with these technologies. Mm -hmm. And so now I'll see if this works here. So generative theories of interaction. Um, mm -hmm. All right, no, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. All right, something is happening with my slides. I do not know what's happening. All right, so I'm gonna just move on because it's about time for me to move on anyway. And so in terms of the symposium, now we're getting to the part where we're really talking about human-computer partnerships. My goal in this uh, symposium is to try to fundamentally change the, the traditional perspectives that we have on how human beings interact with intelligent systems. And to do that, that means that we have to develop a set of research methods that allow us to think about both human beings and interactive systems, and then the phenomenon of interaction between them. So, um, our research challenge here is we want to create systems that are powerful, that give human beings the ability to have a large power of expression. And at the same time, we want to capture the interaction in a form that is as simple as possible. So we value simplicity of expression and we value power of expression. The problem is there's a fundamental compromise between the two of them. This compromise between a powerful system and a simple system is a simple system would be I press a button and it does it for me, but the it is defined by whoever created the button and it'll only do what that button does. A powerful form of expression would be a programming language where I can create any one of a number of expressions and make the system do something, but that requires a tremendous amount of effort and learning on my part as a user. And so there's this compromise between the two of them. And my argument is, as a human-computer interaction researcher, the challenge is not to move along this curve, but rather to offset it. So basically what we want is to keep simple things as simple as possible, and to make complex things possible. So we fundamentally shift the curve, and you can see the different ways. So if I have a system um, here, I don't, yes, you can see that. Here, it's moderately simple and moderately powerful, and I wanna make it more um, powerful, or I can make it simpler, or I can make it more powerful. All right, so when we take the idea of human-computer partnerships, what we're trying to do is transform human-computer interaction in such a way that we fundamentally account for not passive systems, but intelligent systems. And I want to use an analogy here. We have different kinds of relationships that we can have with the computer. We can think of the computer as a tool, which we handle and apply this tool to things. So if I'm playing a piano or using a hammer, I'm thinking of it as a tool. And most of historical research in human-computer interaction takes that perspective. In contrast, you have the computer as a servant, where I delegate tasks to the system or to a person. And there, the idea is that I don't have to do it myself. The system does it for me. And to the extent that the system does it well, that works great. And to the extent that it doesn't, that's a problem. There's a third perspective, which is the computer as a medium, where it allows human beings to connect to other human beings at a distance or over time. Um, and so there it's a, a third thing. And what we're looking for here is we want to think of how to combine the computer as a tool that augments human capabilities and the computer as a servant that takes over certain tasks. But the challenge is how do we do it so that the user maintains control? So in human-computer interaction, we always have a cycle between the user and the system, the user and the system. On, as a researcher in artificial intelligence, the way you publish your research is you publish algorithms. And your measure of success is, is the algorithm better? Does it perform better? Is it more efficient? Does it take less room? Those are all useful and important things, and that's part of the reason why we have such tremendous progress in artificial intelligence over the past decade or so. However, 
there is no incentive to measure the impact on the user. And that's what we do in human-computer interaction. So there's this term, human in the loop, which generally is still accounting for the fact that there are human beings in this cycle interaction, but it's fundamentally about helping the algorithm, right? Their input to the algorithm. Whereas a flip of the perspective to computer in the loop, which is the human-computer interaction perspective, is our measure of success is, is the human being better off? Do they perform better? So we have this kind of problem that's been evolving, which is a lot of AI systems treat the user simply as a source of data for the, in, uh, for the algorithm and treat humans as sort of a component of the machine. So there's a system. It's got AI bits and human bits, and the user is supposed to operate within that system. And the problem is you get certain examples that are sort of like Charlie Chaplin here, where you're sort of the human being is the cog in the machine. And because they don't measure the impact on performance, we end up with a lot of disasters and a lot of situations where things don't work the way they should. So here's an example of um, a, a, a nice example of a simple thing where there's a lot of intelligence going on here. And the system is trying to figure out what the person is typing and help them type better. So here we have somebody saying, just so you know, dad's in prison. And the person say, what? Are you joking? Why are you answering your phone? I'm freaking out. And the person comes back and says, oh, I mean, just so you know, dad's interested, sorry, in the bathroom, dad's interested in dinner tomorrow. And then he says, ha, ah, you just took five years off my life with that autocorrect. I spend my life correcting autocorrect. It is, it's particularly since I do a lot of text in both English and in French, and it's always trying to figure out what I meant and what I'm doing. And what's happening here is, the AI system is having a long-term effect on our behavior. We are moving from being authors of the information, and if we make a mistake, okay, we have a typo, but I have to go back and correct it, but I can think about the output, what I'm actually generating, as opposed to it outputs, I output something, it fixes it for me, a lot of the time it fixes it incorrectly, and I have to notice that it did it, and then I have to check it, so it becomes the checker of the machine. I start being converted from a fully functioning person who's authoring the information to somebody who is simply an error corrector for the machine. That's a shift in roles. And we didn't ask to do that, but it's happening in terms of our daily lives. So the question is, how do we create these human-computer partnerships, taking an HCI, or human-computer interaction perspective, where we think about the role of the human being, how do we make them benefit from the system? How do they gain control? And how do they gain new skills? And how do we empower users over time? So this alternate vision is the idea behind these human-computer partnerships. We want to take advantage of the best features of human beings, but we also, and we also want to take advantage of the best um, characteristics of computers. But we need to remember that those are different skill sets. And fundamentally, very intelligent systems do not think like very intelligent people. It's a different kind of intelligence. We mean different things when we use that word. And that gets us in trouble sometimes. So what we want to do is think about how to improve the impact of these algorithms on human beings. And I want to emphasize the point that a single algorithm, if it's presented differently, can create different kinds of interaction with the user. So for example, if, I present, if I'm trying to navigate through, so I'm a, 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 a captain of a ship, and I'm navigating into a harbor, and I have an intelligence system that's helping me with the navigation. If that information is given to me before I make any decisions, what will happen over time is that I will start to lose my skills as a navigator. I will simply start to rely on this machine, especially if it's 99% correct. And at that point, then I start to lose my skills as a human being and become more dangerous if there's a critical situation that comes up. If I flip that interaction, and I always am required to think about what I want to do and present it, so I have to solve the problem myself. And then the AI system comes in and says, yeah, but there were two other alternatives that are slightly better or slightly worse, depending on this or that or the other thing. Then I'm helping train the user. I'm helping improve their capabilities. 
same algorithm, two different styles of interaction, one helps the user and one hurts the user. And we see this in safety critical systems all the time. Another thing is that different algorithms can create the same interaction. So often, when I talk to my AI colleagues, they ask me which algorithm I'm using, and I'm pretty agnostic, because what I want is an algorithm that's good enough to solve the problem. And if the algorithm has far more performance, that may be irrelevant to me. What I want is the result to be right. So we've done studies with um, intelligent tutoring systems where the tutoring is really just capturing very simple aspects of the phrase. This is not this fully um, elaborate systems that you get from systems like DeepL, for example, which can do full translations. And yet, because it's doing it in a systematic way that's predictable for the user, it's actually easier for the user to understand what the system can and cannot do. Um, so again, we have these things where the performance of the algorithm is only one consideration, and it's not the top consideration if you're thinking about the computer as just part of this interaction loop. OK? So we want to avoid thinking about people simply as a source of data for an algorithm and start thinking about algorithms as a source of information for the user. And keep in mind that a worse algorithm may actually be better for the user. And in that case, we should use the less good algorithm. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about what a partnership is, too. So there's this idea that we're going to um, interact with this intelligence system. What does that mean? So the first kind of interaction that you can think about in a transportation model, say the system is a mode of transportation. If I take a taxi, what's happening is there's a driver, and I delegate control to the driver. This is sort of the standard AI way. I delegate control. And the taxi takes me where I want to go. An alternative view is if I'm driving a motorcycle. This requires me to have a lot of skills. I have to be trained. And yet, when I'm driving that motorcycle, it can be a lot of fun. I can go where I want to go, and I'm fully in control. Those are two extreme models. The third one is a question of how would you share control between a human being and another entity that thinks but not like a human being. And so here the metaphor is of a horse. So when I have a horse that I know, that I grew up with, that the horse knows me, I know the horse, the horse knows where I live. If it's Saturday night and I got a little drunk and I want to get home, I can call a cab, but I could also get on the horse and the horse will take me home. But if I want to go out and have fun and go jumping or go out in the woods and, and go for a ride, then I can also do the, that with the horse. So the idea is that how do we take advantage of these different capabilities on both sides between the horse and the rider? All right, and so there we are. We want to have this kind of um, varied interaction fully under the user's control. So another thing that I want to say is that we have short, medium, and long-term relationships with computers. And I'm not going to go into detail here, but if you look at evolutionary biology, what they're doing is they're looking at the relationships among species and how they interact with each other. And you can have symbiotic relationships where it's a positive interaction over time, where both where each of the two species benefit from being with each other. You can also have highly competitive and destructive relationships, and you can have all kinds of different models, and they study this in depth. What we need to do is think about human beings as if they are a species, and intelligent systems as species, and of course there's many different ones, right? Many different human beings, many different um, intelligent algorithms, and think about whether or not we're creating a long-term symbiotic relationship, which is ideal, or are we creating other kinds of relationships where at least one party has a neutral reaction and the other one benefits, and try to avoid these negative things that you get, for example, in social media, where you have this addictive relationship that gets established, and so a short-term interaction becomes a very negative one over time. So I'm going to talk about a concept that is influenced by evolutionary biology called co-adaptation. And this is based on the observation, lots of observations, empirical observations of users and technology. And what you find are there are two phenomena that happen. One is users 
adapt to the technology. If I am a designer and I create a user interface, the user is going to have to figure out how that interface works. So they have to learn how to use it. But there's another thing that goes on as well. Every time people use technologies, they are also using their understanding of the world to try to figure out how to adapt the technology to meet their own needs. They want to appropriate it. And this is more subtle. It is far less often studied, but it's very important. And if you look at the history of things like, for example, the spreadsheet, that's a case where there was an underlying structure, basically rows and col columns, and the ability to put a little bit of computation in each cell and to cross-reference those cells. That structure allowed users to do a huge variety of different kinds of things, which evolved over time, and people created more and more elaborate things. So you don't just do uh, the original use of a spreadsheet was to calculate totals of um, numbers in a budget. And now it's created what-if style budgeting, where you try to manage different kinds of uh, options and different inputs, but it's also used to do electronic circuits and create posters and organize agendas and do all kinds of other things because people have appropriated it. Now, if we look on the AI side, we start having this other side, which is what I call reciprocal co-adaptation. Now we have a situation where while the user is adapting to the technology and adapting the technology for their own purposes, the system can be also doing that. They can be adapting to the user, learning from the user, and changing the behavior in that way, and also modifying the user's behavior. Sometimes this is pos positive. So for example, the user can be, use an intelligent system to learn things, which is very useful, or it can be manipulative. So persuasive systems, and a lot of AI is used to basically encourage you to buy stuff. The underlying model is sell ads, and that's a huge, huge, multi, 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 probably trillion, yeah, multi-trillion dollar business, and it's manipulating human behavior based on a lot of understanding from experimental psychology and behavioral economics. So <clears throat> when we create a human-computer partnership, we want to create a number of these things, and we want to pay attention to this phenomenon of co reciprocal co-adaptation. I'm thinking about how to make systems that are more easy to discover from the user's perspective, easier for them to appropriate, and also, in terms of appropriability, not just reusing the tools, but also find new ways of expressing themselves through these tools. So now I will start giving you some examples. We'll get out of the theory and into the examples. So discoverability, how, we, how does a user discover the capabilities of a system? Well, there's this notion of explainability in AI. And I generally get into a battle when I talk to my AI colleagues, because the way it is handled in the artificial intelligence literature is the goal of explainability is to explain the model to the user. There's an algorithm or a model, and this is how it works. And not to think about its effect on the user. Fundamentally, though, users don't care. There's a few very sophisticated data scientists who are expert in artificial intelligence who do care about how the model works. But for the most part, an ordinary user doesn't care about the model. What they care about is, what did the system understand of what I've just been doing? How can I, what can I do now? Um, how can I ask for what I want? And how do I fix errors? So if you go back to that little dialogue that I showed you earlier, the user has no idea and does not care why the system interpreted the words and slotted in prison instead of whatever they were originally planning to say. And it's not part of the user's experience. It's not in, the, in that moment. They don't care what the model does. What they care about is how do I fix it and how do I prevent it from happening and how do I tell the system I don't want you to do that anymore. So. We have this thing, I love this um, from George Box, who's an experimental, uh, he's a, does exploratory data analysis and he's a statistician. And he says, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So the claim that I want to make is, it's not that we shouldn't be building models and building algorithms, but we have to remember that we only want to use them to the extent that they actually are useful and we have to consider the impact on the user. 
All right, so now I'm going to give you a couple of examples. This is a very simple one from uh, one of our students, Nolgwen Mude, and it's called a color partner. And the idea is that you go in and you study how graphic designers and other artists work with color. And current color pickers involve picking a pixel out of a circle of colors, and it isn't very easy to explore a color space. So what the idea here is, the user wants to be able to take on the role of specifying which colors they're interested in, but they don't want to use words to specify colors, and they want more than a pixel to kind of choose from things. They want to get a set of options. So what we do is we have an intelligence system that suggests relevant um, colors, but it's under the user's control because the user can use the position, the distance from the current dot to another space. So if it's close, I want colors that are close. And if it's far, I want colors that are more different. And then the system can kind of come in and start um, explaining. So this is what it looks like. Participant 4 saves intermediate color selections in the space outside the document. So balance. this is based on participatory design and, and covering what we do with the user. And then here she is with color the color partner. partner. user specify two starting colors and then generates a series of colored dots influenced by the cursor's distance from the most recent dot. Right. Users can click to preserve favorite colors and reuse them to start new color chains. So, so there's no explanation going on here. There's nothing that says this is how the model is interpreting it. This percentage of color is mapped to that thing. What it is is it's just the user acting, the system suggesting, the user adjusting, User making things, their preferences known by adding, clicking on that thing to make it a little bit bigger, or ignoring it and then it fades away. And the general, it's a very fluid interaction, very simple, and yet it's using this very simple method. From, from an AI point of view, it's not terribly intelligent. It's a little bit intelligent, but not terribly. But from the user interaction point of view, it's way better. And this is a case where we get a lot more functionality uh, with a very simple form of expression, but a lot more power. Another one here is based on a series of projects we've done with adding gesture interaction to a phone. So you've got your smartphone. And right now, basically, when you interact with it, you just press on buttons or you pick things from the menu. And so it's got a lot of different possibilities, but in terms, it's, a, it's very simple to use. Billions of people in the world use these things, so it has a very low threshold to entry. But it's not very powerful in terms of expression. You can only do what's on that app and what, how it's been designed. So here, what we'd like to do is create a set of commands that are based on users' gestures, which gives us a wide range of different kinds of ways of controlling the system, and take advantage of a human characteristic, which is, if I'm a novice and I don't know the mapping between this gesture and, say, the cut command, let's see, yes, that's the cut command, then what do I do? Well, I hesitate, I pause. And then a dynamic guide will appear. If I'm an expert, though, I do not want to stop. I want to just make that gesture immediately. Okay? So we're distinguishing between novices and experts, but we're not putting them in one category or another because we, the designers of the system, don't know. We let the user reveal to the system what their level of expertise is, and then we let the system respond accordingly. And so here we have this notion of progressive feedback, which is I discover what the system has already understood. It's showing me as I progress, the line is what I actually did, and it's showing me what's possible. So the progressive feed forward tells me what I can do in the future. Now, and it's also the case that the width of the path tells me the likelihood that that um, path will be recognized as that particular gesture. So here we're trying to get to the help command, and by drawing it here, this will play a couple of times. So um, here's a user, the whole set of options go up, the orange path is the one to follow, and the user can just do that. Now if I'm a novice user, if I want to get help, what I can do is I see all of the different paths available, and the other ones slowly get rid of, they get smaller and the paths get, th and they disappear over time. And now it should show me, oh, it's just looping. All right. Uh, I think 
that's it. Um, if I already know how to do the command, it will um, just let me do it. And if I want to pause halfway through, it'll show me what commands are available. And so this should show me that. All right, so here we see that it actually working on the phone. It's integrated into this system. And you can see the desired command here is going to be call Alice. And you notice how the paths get thinner. So the system is revealing to the user what it's understood and what's possible as the user does it. But there's no words and there's no model being explained. And this is what happens in an intermediate state. Um, I think I'm going to keep moving. Now, that's discoverability. That's trying to figure out how the system works. The next thing that I want to talk about is appropriability, because we would like users to be able to create their own commands and generate their own forms of interaction. So I'll show you a few examples here. Um, one of the things is um, something that we call field, uh, field word. And the idea is to create these gesture commands that I was just talking about. So the ones that you saw before had already been created and were in the system, and the user needs to figure out how this particular command works. Now what I want to do is say, well, I don't like doing that for call Alice. I want to do something else. And so this creates a challenge. We have different forms of expertise on the user side and the computer side. On the user side, it has to be something that I personally can remember. It has to be memorable. And on the system side, it has to be something that can be distinguished from other commands that are already in the data set. These are two fundamentally different requirements, and only the user knows the first one, which are the commands that they want to actually create. So the way that we do this is we create a heat map that reveals to the user how the system is understanding their gesture over time. So basically the idea is that if I draw a gesture and it ends in blue, it is easy for the system to recognize, which means that it is unique and easy to distinguish from other gestures in the data set. If it stops in purple, it's ambiguous. And if it stops in red, that means it's already defined. By the way, you could use this as a way of discovering which commands are already in the system, because it's doing that. So there's something inherently discoverable about this technique, as well as personalizable and appropriable. So here we have the example. So here he's creating a timer. I type timer, and field word displays a colored background that changes as I draw. Progressive feed forward helps disambiguate gestures. So the first one stopped in red, didn't work. Gestures Second one, blue, it's OK. It's safer to try again. Here we go. Gestures that end in a red zone already exist. Either continue drawing or try again. Gestures that end Just in a blue zone are unique and easy for the system to recognize. What if this gesture already exists? I can try something completely different, or I can draw into the blue zone to make it recognizable. So I can continue. It gives me, if I've started a gesture and I want to just add more, it continues to work. Now, what's interesting about this is when we tested this with users, what we found is people started creating gesture grammars. So imagine that I want to use this as a communication device, and I want to say, call mom, or FaceTime with my son, or you know, whatever. What I can do is I can have a set of gestures that are related to the actions, like calling, texting, and FaceTiming. And I can have a set of gestures that are associated with different people, like mom, dad, my son, whatever. And at that point, then if I combine these two, then I have a compound gesture that is easy to rec remember, and it gives me tremendous power of expression with this same simplicity of interaction. And it's all been defined by the user. Another thing is that it's revealing how the underlying model works. So not only, so here's a case where it turns out that, gestures, uh, that users have a tendency to think that the gesture is a static gesture. But in fact, the algorithm is understanding the dynamics of the interaction over time. So here, a straight line is not the gesture. It's the moving up or moving down. 
And so the same, what looks to the user to be the same gesture is actually two different gestures. And so here you see, if I stop going up, it already exists, but if I go down, it doesn't. And so that means I could use that as a different gesture. So this, again, expands the power of expression for the users, and they can discover this as they go. Another thing that I want to do, shifting out of the phone metaphor, and not metaphor, phone uh, substrate or basis, is uh, going into a different domain, which is working with composers. <clears throat> this is work I did with Jeremy Garcia, who's on the left there, and a composer, multiple composers at IRCAM in Paris. And what we find is that composers are fundamentally interested in creating their own way of representing information. And they are not interested in doing things the way everybody else does. In fact, if I create a tool that is specifically designed for them, I mean, it's designed for one person, another composer who needs that tool will not want to use it because it affects the originality of their um, composition. And so what we're looking at is how do we allow people to build on their existing ways of sketching out ways of structuring and understanding their music in, um, and then be able to build on top of that. So this is a project where we're creating what we call paper substrates and they capture musical relationships. This relationship here, this honeycomb uh, grid with the hexagonal cells is not a spreadsheet, but it has some of the characteristics. It is a tonnets, and it was created by Uller in the 1700s for analyzing Western music. And we have a composer at IRCAM who's using it as a way of composing and even performing music. So what happens, we're working with a technology called Anodo, which allows us to draw ink on paper, but at the same time capture what is drawn on the computer, and we know which pen, which stroke, the speed of the stroke, and all kinds of other information associated with this. And that gives us a lot of benefit in terms of working with users. So here's an example of a composer designing something with uh, a tonus. Although, first, let me just tell you, what do I mean by a substrate? So a substrate is the underlying structure that allows you to interpret data. So data does not just sit there by itself. It has to be interpreted in some way. And we create tools that operate on that data. And we can create different kinds of substrates that are more or less powerful. Um, this is an example. If I give you this set of dots, and I give it to you, but I also give it to an algorithm, and I ask the question, what do those dots mean? And what happens if I move one of those dots? You can't really tell me. Right now, this is like a bitmap, and it's just you know, ink on, on the screen. But if I put a, a score behind it and a treble clef, all of a sudden now you can interpret those dots. And it matters. Now I can't move the dot just anywhere. I have to move it on a line or just between two lines. I don't have other options. And if I have a treble clef or a bass clef, that affects what the music means. So what the substrate is doing is giving me a way of interpreting the data that is understandable to the user. A different interpretation would be to have this be a graph, right? And I can put my x and y axis and connect them. And a different one would be a map where I can show where I am. In each case, those dots are interpreted differently and the user understands how to interact with them differently based on the underlying structure. And a great example of a substrate that we all use is the notion of a spreadsheet, which gives this underlying structure that is very visible and easy for the user to interact with and interpret. So if we go back to the music composers, <clears throat> now what they're doing is they're creating their own underlying structures for putting in their data and then creating tools to interact with that. So here's an example, and I hope you can hear that, right? It's very loud, it's low. Ah, what's happened? Can you, I don't know how to make this go up. Can you hear it? A little bit, okay. It's a little slow. So basically, as you go from cell to cell, it plays the note, and you can see that on the partition there on the right, excuse me, the score on the right, you see the notes appearing, and it's as if you're playing the piano. 
right, so that was somebody working on the bass clef, um, bass part, and now he can do chords. Chords are, of course, multiple um, notes playing at the same time. So he can connect them in this different space. These ones are connected by double lines, so that tells you that you can create chords here. And now he's going to work on the melody. And notice now the speed variation is important. He goes, I'm not going to sing it. So he's getting that. And he's doing it slowly as he's sort of working it out. And then we'll hear what happens. So now it's all put together. He's got the melody, he's got the chords and everything. And this is all done by just creating this structure on paper and drawing it and then composing it that way. Um, and what's interesting is if you give this to children at a, a science fair, which we've done, um, what happens is you say, draw your name, and they'll draw their name and delightedly hear how it all sounds. But if you give it to a professional musician, they will immediately start exploring it and looking at different relationships and offsetting relationships and so on. So it has this power of expression with this simplicity of interaction fundamental to it. And here we go. Another thing that is really basically the purest form of creating your own gestures is a system that I did with um, Thanis Tzandilas a while back, um, which is called knotty gestures. And the idea of a knot is that it's the simplest thing for the system to understand. If you draw a line and you put a go around like that, that's a knot, and that is 100% recognizable. We don't have recognition problems. It's not an difficult from an AI point of view. However, um, what it does is it gives the user the ability to draw anything they like and embed functionality into their drawing in any way they want. So for example, you can specify commands like recording audio and things like that, or defining mathematical relationships as you like. So I'll give you an example here. If I draw a line and I just say, this is going to be record. So this is my dot. And I said, OK, now this line is going to be a recording. And I'm going to do a second dot. And I say, this is going to be the start of the recording. And a third dot that says, this is the end of the recording. And then I can go back and forth and play my recording. So if I'm taking notes, for example, here, if you're all taking notes, you could be drawing on your notes. And you could say, yeah, that's an interesting thing. I want to be able to record what Wendy is saying as she's talking. And you could just make that. And then later on, when you go back to your notes, you could just play that again. Or you could go anywhere you like within that line and get to that point in the recording. And again, the system shows you what it's doing. Um, it's not telling you how the algorithms work. What it's doing is it's showing you a lightweight way of interacting that the user stays in control of. Um, so here's a couple of examples. He's drawing gestures with an S, you know, so that could be something, although. But you see the pen, this particular version of the pen, has a little tiny screen, and it tells you what it's doing here. So what it's done is he's um, defined that as record. And then if I go this forward, the first comment. he says, this is the first comment. This is the second comment. So he's just adding this, and he's speaking out loud. This is the first comment. And now it's playing it back. This is the second comment. Right. And you can go on here with, um, like here he's showing um, how to do mathematical formulae. So he's looking, he's doing sines and cosines and so on. You get the square root, you get the sine. And so it's saying that there's a set of functionality that's captured in the pen and you just write with it and you want to calculate things. You just write what you want and it'll figure it out for you. Um, so I think that's basically it. Another one that I like very much is, again, with Jeremy Garcia, and he worked with Philippe Leroux, who's a professional, um, world-famous composer. And he, uh, Philippe was working with 13th century musical scores. And if you look at that, and you see on there, the notes look kind of similar to what we do, but they have these funny flags at the end. And what was happening then is before you had codified words like allegro or andante from Italian, what they would do is, is show the expression of how you're supposed to play this by the shape and the sort of gesture that's associated with this um, 
flag on the, on the note. And so what Philippe wanted to do is create a way of interacting on paper with these notes and to create a new composition and also use this as a way of both composing and performing. So he worked with Jeremy, who's the one who did the previous, uh, excuse me, well, Jeremy and uh, Fanis and me, but um, the, the paper composer, this is another one in that vein. And here you see what he's doing is we've made a copy of the um, original manuscript, and then you have the Anoto pen, and there's a set of functionality up top, which are basically buttons up here, that allow you to, the user to define how they want to interpret what is drawn as the user goes. So this is a really good example of a substrate where there's different kinds of functionality created by the user that can be applied to different kinds of reactions from the system. Um, so for example, if I want to capture, let's just play it here. Um, so here, what he's doing is he's going to draw the shape and keep track of how quickly it's done. And basically, the variations of the gestures are captured and then transformed into different musical functionality. This is a system called Open Music, which is interpreting that data and then creating something that. Here we go. So, Machot is the um, original composer. So we have the trajectories here. Notice that's a handwritten score, which what he's doing is he's translating the computer stuff back into human stuff, and he's stretching it out. So the violin and the guitar are following this. So you see this really interesting back and forth between the user, thinking about what does that interaction look like. The system has a lot of functionality, but it's designed in a way that is fully under the user's control. He gets to decide how to interpret these gestures and what to do with them. All right. Another one that I'd like to talk about, and this is a different way of thinking about how to appropriate technology for yourself, is how do we create personalized expressive output? And basically, we don't want to necessarily treat all input from the user as the same. Sometimes we want to take account of the individual variation. We see this in the real world. So if I'm writing by hand, it's imp you can tell that I wrote it versus somebody else writing it. My handwriting is unique to me. And sometimes that's good. Sometimes I can write beautifully. Sometimes I'm in a hurry and I write in a messy way. But all of that is captured and it provides information to other human beings and perhaps to an intelligence system if I do it. What happens is if I'm in the model on the right, I type in different ways. I may gesture type, I may tap type, I may do different kinds of things, but the output all looks the same. And I have to go to a lot of trouble to put in an emoji or do something else to create variation that reflects what I'm actually doing as I write. So we created a system called the Expressive Keyboard. This is with um, Sally Alvina and Joe Malik. Um, and basically, the idea is that we take advantage of gesture typing or swipe typing, where you have a soft keyboard on the screen, and instead of tapping, what I can do is draw from letter to letter. One of the things here, there's a difference in what we're trying to do from what the intelligent system is. The folks at, it was originally IBM that invented this, Shuman Chai invented this at IBM, and now he's at Google, and you see this on Apple keyboards and everywhere. And the idea is, from an AI point of view, the sole goal is to come up with understanding the correct word that the user wanted to say. And as I mentioned before, it's often wrong. But basically, it's pretty good. And so that's the AI goal. Let's get the right word. And any kind of user variation is treated as noise. It's something to throw away, to get rid of. We don't like that. However, it, and it's a useful thing. If I can do swipe typing, that means I'm going back and forth. 
um, from letter to letter. Uh, if I can figure out how to get rid of that variation, I get a 40% increase in typing speed, which in human-computer interaction terms is a very big increase. So as you can see, this word here, pepper, I can do it underneath, I can do it over, and I can do it back and forth, and all that variation is accounted for by these algorithms, which are very, very clever. And here you can see, this is the word great, and all of those are drawn in different ways, and they all are treated as um, a correct solution. Now the problem that we get is that instead of throwing away that gesture variation, what we can do is capture it, interpret it, and now we're in a different layer. What we're doing is continuing to use the first set of algorithms to figure out what is the correct word, but we also have a separate set that is doing a feature analysis and mapping those features of the user's gesture to different forms of output, which could be RGB color, it could be different fonts, it could be expressions on an emoji. Any of those things can be controlled by the user. So the idea is that instead of throwing away this user variation, we allow the user to capture and control it. And we worked with a professional typographer, Olivier Ninul, who created a series of different type fonts that the users can then control how they express, from very simple and plain, which is the basic way of doing it, to very elaborate, or something that is fun for kids, or something that is elegant, or, or whatever. Um, so here, type texts all look the same. This is basically the same Swipe idea. Swipe keyboards enter text by drawing a gesture through the letters of each word. The system guesses the correct word, even if it's drawn in different ways. Here, straight, curvy, and kind of crazy. But the system throws away these variations. What if we could vary text as we type to create rich, personalized output? Expressive keyboard keeps the correct word, but also recycles the variation in each gesture to create rich output. You can see that the cake changes from a normal to fancy. She's changing the color as she goes, and she's creating different fonts, and she can do that under her control. All right, I'm going to keep going because I'm realizing I'm running late. Um, we can also enhance the power of expression by adding these things together. This is something that we created called um, the command board, and we can create and define different commands. And we can use this um, octopocus style where we generate um, the different possibilities so people can figure out what's already there. We can let people type words and say execute it. Um, so any command that's available on the system can be accessed by direct gestures, and people can create their own gestures for executing those commands to do them more generally. Um, I'm going to jump through this, and I want to say something about studying interaction. This is the last thing I wanted to do because I realize I'm running late. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about how we shape behavior, and I want to use an example from a system that we created with a group of artists on how to think about teaching a gesture without explaining it, without even explaining that we are trying to teach you the gesture. So we're in a situation where there is a large display, it's Christmas time, it's created out, it's in a shopping center in Evry, but it's outside of the Agora Theater, and it's called the Grand Vitrine de Noël, and we did this expo in 2017. It was there for a month, and we did it in several other places as well. And the idea is you create an interactive experience where the user and the system are sharing control. And we use a principle that comes from, I'm going to say, talk about reinforcement learning, but not the AI version, the original one that comes from experimental psychology, for which we have 100 years of experimental understanding and, and um, experience with. And the idea here is that we shape the user's movement so that they can control an animated character. And you can see that there's a, a faint little, there's a big elaborate machine, and then there's a Santa Claus, animated Santa Claus character in the middle. I just want to show you what the machine looks like. This is the reinforcer. The goal is for the user to be able to interact with this little animated Santa Claus here 
and make this machine start working. And it's really just a lovely, noisy, strange thing. And you can see Santa Claus doing various things like that. It's basically run with a simple connect, not fancy algorithms. And what we're trying to do <clears throat> is basically whenever the user does something that is close to the desired behavior. And in fact, the desired behavior is to get you to wave your hands over your head. So these are just passers-by. Um, before Christmas, they're shoppers, and they're going to just come in, and they stand in front of it, and they play with it. And what we want to do is get them to do this. And so <clears throat> what we do is we re reinforce what are called successive approximations to the final behavior. If the user's behavior is somewhat close, then Santa moves up a step and he has to go up three steps in order to launch the machine. And otherwise, he gets bored and the step kind of drops down. So um, if the user uh, can find the correct movements by trial and error, then all is well, and they launch the machine. We do this in a particular way. The first thing we do is we mirror um, Santa's movements. And so the first 30 seconds, the system is going to be um, following what the user is doing. And then after that, it switches. And all of a sudden, Santa starts doing something different than what the user is doing. This is what's called extinction in reinforcement learning. And basically, when Santa is acting independently, the user starts doing other kinds of things and tries to get the, user to, uh, the Santa Claus to interact. And at that point, then you've got the user's attention. And then the user's trying different things. And this principle of extinction says they will do more behaviors. If you think about that from if you go to a coffee machine, you put your money in, and it doesn't work, instead of just walking away, what you'll do is start doing more behaviors. That's extinction behavior. You're going to try to make something work. And then out of those behaviors, one of them may work, and then that will be reinforced, and you will continue to do that, and you will know that that's the right thing to do. So basically, this is what's happening here. The users do that, and Santa rewards the user if they're getting closer to this movement um, by moving up a step. And I'll just show you what it looks like. Here we have a young girl. Yes, we have permission from her parents and her to show this. Um, you can see the Santa Claus moving as she's moving on the left. On the left, your left too. She's up top. Um, you can see the connect. Um, which is basically a simple skeleton, not very smart algorithm, but off the shelf, we can use it. And on the right, you see um, um, the system actually interpreting and figuring out what the movements are. And it, it goes red and green according to whether it's up, up appropriate. And you can see that the um, Santa is moving up and up and up. And eventually, he's going to get there. Come on, she's working harder. That's extinction. She's trying to get it. She knows. But the problem is her hands are going down. That's not good. She needs to get them both up. So finally, she gets it. All right, and I'm going to keep going here. This is a guy who's an adult. He's very systematic in how he does it, but he actually manages to do it. And then I'm going to just show you her, because she's not systematic at all. She's just doing all kinds of random stuff. But it works with her as well. And yeah, all right. So basically, I'm going to conclude here by saying that basically beyond creating algorithms, we want to think about human-computer partnerships and interaction in general as a phenomenon that we can study and that we can work with users to look at the short-term, mid-term, and even long-term impact on users. And I just want to say that here we are. We've got power of expression, very important, and simplicity of execution. And the challenge here is to create something that's simple but powerful. And I will stop there. I realize I've gone over. I've done more than my 15, my 45 minutes. So I'm setting a very bad example for everybody else, because you're not supposed to do that. But anyway, we'll have a little bit of a pause afterwards, so we'll squish in the time. Um, are there any questions? Um, is there anything I can answer here? So, Because I'd like to have a discussion with you. How, what do you think? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Si vous avez des questions, j'ai un micro, je peux vous le passer. OK. That, that will be easier for other people. So there's a question over here. 
Thank you. A uh, very interesting example. I, I noticed that most of the work that you're showing is showing a partnership in the sense of uh, more perception than symbolic reasoning. That's correct, yes. And, and, and I was wondering if you were investigating this area too, like uh, helping someone to conceptualize uh, something. We haven't done a lot of work in that area, although you will, we are, there are different kinds of projects that we do. Conceptualizing something is tricky because it's hard to measure how much people have conceptualized. And all the things you see here, we can work on a very, I didn't show you the experiments that we do, but we can do very rigorous controlled experiments with both qualitative and quantitative data that allow you to figure out whether we're succeeding. And a lot of what we're trying to do is think about what it means to study interaction as a phenomenon in its own right and how to do that. But you're absolutely right that if we figure out how to do this, we should be able to also apply it there. And of course, there's tremendous amount of um, application for it because there's a lot of work in decision making, for example, human decision making and, and machine decision making and figuring out how you conceptualize things is very complex and we're dealing with complex algorithms and complex systems. Um, and you will be talking, I assume, about that this afternoon, so we will um, move on. Uh, there's, and, sorry, there's, there's another a, question here. Another question down here, yes. Wendy, thank you very much. Uh, this was very uh, inspiring, interesting. Um, uh, I, I would like to go back actually to a slide that was even, I think, or slightly close to that slide. That was uh, this kind of idea that you draw from biology of the different relationships, you know. Oh, that's of, way back. The one with all the complexity. Yeah, 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 it was the complexity. That's way uh, Exactly, back. and it goes uh, down, it drills down, yeah, it's at the very beginning. Um, uh, uh, and it kind of, it touches the question, you know, how the relationship between an intelligent system and uh, its human users change. Yeah. yeah. Uh, also with a horse, I like the horse example. This is a very good example. Yes. Because the horse can be used in many different ways, as you said. You know, it can bring you not everywhere when you're drunk, but it can bring you home, for example, or right. certain places, you know, that it knows. And, and this, uh, in biology, you know, Somehow, of course, you know, the, the researchers that study the systems basically uh, um, assume that these, the human and the intelligent system have actually a right of existence, uh, existence in their own way, you know? That, that's how it's organized, you know? That is and true. I, and, and I wonder a little bit, because this is a very strong cultural also uh, influence in how you then would start to study actually the phenomenon of interaction, yeah? yeah. So if you, so I wonder how you see this uh, type of partnership, you know, if you take, for example, the symbiotic relationship, this would assume actually that the system would benefit from the uh, interaction in the same way actually the human would. Well, I would argue that it's not necessarily, I would agree with you about benefit, yes. but not necessarily in the same way. Okay. And for me, one of the things that's happening is we have very large corporations that are developing a lot of monopoly power. So you get Facebook, for example, yeah. that has <clears throat> right now, I would argue, a negative long-term relationship, a short-term benefit. If I get to like something and see that people like me and all of that, there's a short-term reinforcing value to that, and we understand that from the psychology of it. But the long-term relationship ends up being very positive for Facebook, they make a lot of money, and often very bad, both for the individual user and for society, because you see all of these sort of white supremacist groups and things like that that are being reinforced by this. And the argument that I'm making here is, why are we not going to these evolutionary biologists who really have studied this very hard? And they have a lot of tools and methods for looking at this. And we're only just scratching the surface and we're not really taking that into account. And the other thing that I want to emphasize is that these are relationships that happen over really long periods of time. I mean, for them, it can be millennia. You know, it's really long periods of time. For us, it's, it's shorter. This is why I call it co-adaptation instead of co-evolution, because it's a much shorter relationship, and both of those exist in biology. But here, the idea is how do we study that, and how do we look at that impact? And I think mm. it's really important. Mm. Yeah, maybe a, a very quick follow-up. So I'm, uh, um, I find this interesting, because in a way, um, as you've uh, uh, framed it now, uh, and I understand this, you know, the, the system itself 
and actually, um, so is not only just the algorithm, but the whole kind of environment. Like in Facebook, it's also the shareholders that then get right. benefit from it and so on. So it's not only actually, it's not only uh, the algorithm in a way. Yeah. Yes. So, no, yeah. I, I agree. And, and again, this is where it helps to go and look at evolution of biology because they talk about ecosystems yeah. okay. and they talk about, you know, this niche and they talk about, like, I just read a thing about these jumping worms that have yeah. come from Asia and they, they eat everything yeah. and they're an invasive species and they're looking at the impact on a bunch of other species and the overall cycle. So again, I think you're absolutely right. And I think it's a good metaphor that we should be paying more yeah. attention to. Okay. So. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. I think, is there one last question before we take a little bit of a break? Or are you going to? Yes, one last question here. So do you need AI to have a human-computer partnership? No, I don't think so. Although it depends on your definition of what AI is. Um, because at some level, the level of intelligence, the threshold for being intelligence changes over time. Um, I'll give you an example. When I started my career many years ago, I studied monkeys learning language. And I say monkeys, I really mean apes, um, because there's a difference. And monkeys don't, and apes kind of do, but at a very limited way. And one of the things that was happening at the time was the initial reaction of the scientific community was, Higher order primates, um, other than human beings, cannot learn language. And then as you get more and more examples of um, chimps learning sign language or gorillas learning sign language and doing more and more things, the barrier for what it means to be intelligence was raised and raised and raised. And I remember writing a paper on, um, can we teach, uh, let's see, can, can chimps t discuss talking uh, learning, no, can chimps learn to talk about learning to talk or something like that? And the idea is no, it's getting back to the thing that Tomah was talking about, about this sort of conceptual learning and so on. So our barrier for what is intelligent behavior has risen, um, and yet, and I think it probably will keep doing, the more we understand it, the less intelligent it seems. Um, but at the same time, yeah, given that caveat, um, some of these things that we now understand, we no longer consider intelligent, but they are part of human-computer partnerships. But, but isn't what's important is whether the user considers the system to yes. be intelligent. And in fact, users anthropomorphize, meaning they make systems act like, the way you deal with a dog is you, you think the dog is thinking the way you do, and, and, and there are elements of it that, that actually are, and there are elements that aren't. Um, and similar with systems. We have lots of examples where people assume that an intelligent system is intelligent in the way humans are. And a lot of companies take advantage of that, in fact. And uh, so chat box are designed to be human-like, and people can get fooled, and that can be an issue. All right, thank you very much for the questions, and we'll take a break, and then we will start again at 10.30, and Antonio will be giving that talk. Thanks very much.